Matthew chapter, verse, hey, you're a good student, right? Matthew 5, verse 20, let's start there. Matthew chapter 5. David, uh, uh, Jesus says, for I say unto you, unless your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisee, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. That means there is something you must do that the Pharisee and the scribes are doing that you must do, you must better them at their game. Okay? And I went into for a whole new uh, couple months talking about that. I'm still going to continue with it. And then somebody came to me and says, Muruti, you know, June was a month of young people. So you spend time with one young people, and then young people says, Muruti, tell me, after I have I've done righteousness, what next? It hit me. I says, wait a bit. This young person is right. I need to tell you, why do we push for righteousness? Is that okay? And then I've given you a slide. The first slide that I said, I gave you, it was the definition of what is it, righteousness? What does it mean? And then we found, if you go into the word, the definition of righteousness is right standing with God. Can you see that on the, on the board? The definition is right standing with God. And then it says, okay, how do I get right standing with God? How do my life become right standing with God? It says, you must be born again. Okay, it's fine. I'm born again. I accepted Jesus as my Savior. He washed my sins away. What next? We said, for you, after the Lord has washed your blood and you are born again, you have a duty to bring other people into the kingdom. Okay? I said that statement, but I never substantiated it. I've never showed it to you in the Bible. Is that okay? Let me show it in the Bible so that you should know. After you are born again, your duty is to bring other people to be born again. It's not the duty I'm root. No. It is not the duty of the shepherd. The duty of the shepherd is to feed the sheep. It is the duty of the sheep to make the lambs. Are you getting it? It is not the, the, the shepherd to make the lambs. It is the duty of the sheep when they are fed, not fed up, but they are fed. To make lambs. You understand that, friends? Let, 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 me, let me substantiate that so that you can get it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. Give me 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, it says, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, this is big words only. Bring it in the New Living Translation. And all of this is a gift from God. Okay. Now, you don't say to a person, and now, all this, and now. You don't start by sentence and say, and now. Is that okay? Let's go back to verse 16. So that we could understand it. Verse 16. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet we know him thus no longer. Verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new what? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Tell your neighbor, says, good morning, new creation. Morning. Tell him, you are a new creation. That means you are something that has never existed before. A new creation means you are something that has never happened before. 
That's why when after you are born again and somebody says to you, you say to him, yes, the one who no is no more. This is a new creation. This is a new person. God has forgiven me my sins. You know me when my sins were still standing and then I went through the river. My sins were washed. Now, the one who comes out on the other side is different from the one who went into the river. The one who you knew yesterday, something happened between yesterday and today. And what happened? After the time you saw me yesterday, I went through the river. I went through the cross. And when I went through the cross, something happened. The person who came out this side, the one who came in was having sins. The one who come out is a new creation. Does it make sense? That's what the Bible says, you are a new creation. That's when the enemy accuses you of your yesterday sin. Tell him, excuse me, Jesus has washed me. It's not that I didn't do, but Jesus has cleansed my slate. It's clean. Is that okay? That's why it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. What? What happened to all things? What happened to all things? You know, if you check, many times when the enemy accuses you, he accuses you about your yesterday failure. He accuses you of the temptation you fell in yesterday. But this is not a passport to make you commit sin. So that tomorrow I'll be a new creature. No. I'm saying this because when the enemy accuses you, you say to him, yes, enemy, I did it yesterday, but I confessed it to Jesus. And that's why I'm a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Now, do you know there are some people who always accuse you, but why is it was alone by it? No, no. After, after they had, we were drinking with him, now he thinks he's different. No, the Bible says all things have become we don't understand that in the spirit realm, in, in the physical, but in the spirit realm, it happens. All things have become? Okay, verse 18. That's why he says, and all this is a gift from God. You are yesterday's washing away. You are yesterday's failure. It's a gift from God. Is that okay? Who brought us back to himself? That means God was Brother, and has given us this task of reconciling people. Guys, if you don't hear this verse, please stand up and go home. What has he done? He has given us the task. Tell your neighbor, you have a task. Tell the one on the other side, you have a duty. Tell the one behind you, says, you have a work to do. What is the work that you are supposed to do? Is to reconcile people back to God. So when you are born again, it's not the end of the story. You are not born again so that you can go and, and begin to be pompous to people. You are born again, then you have a task of making other people born again. Does it make sense, friends? All right. Have I cleared this to you? I was saying this. Go back to, give me that slide again. That if you are to be, to be right standing, you must be born again. Why are you born again? So that you can make other people become born again also. The same way you became born again, God will use you to get other people become born again. Is that okay? But now, if we want to be honest with you, the more we try to make people born again, the more they don't listen. <laughs> Have you tried it and people ridicule you? Have you tried to let people to Jesus and they don't get it? 
And I think last Sunday, I showed you what is the reason, what is the cause that we are not getting people to be born again. I said the problem is not the people. The problem is us. You know, many times when a, something has happened, it's very rare people look at themselves and say, you know what, this thing did not work out and it's my fault. How many times have we had people say, it's my fault? Normally people don't like to say it's my fault. They always look for reason. We're pointing at other people. Is that okay? When Adam has sinned, God comes to me and says, Adam, what have you done? What did he say? He blames God. We always have this blame game. We blame other people. And 99.99% of the the problem is ours. The reason we are ministering to people and people are not being born again, it's not their fault, it is our fault. The problem is ours. Are you hearing me, friends? If you go to the doctor, you are sick, and the doctor gives you medicine, and you don't get healed, whose fault is it? Is it the doctor's or is it yours? It's your problem. The doctor has given you the medicine. You didn't drink the, t- the thing. Now you blame the doctor. Yeah, this doctor, I don't get healed. Excuse me. I gave you the medicine. You didn't drink the thing. Are you getting it now? And this is where I'm trying to deal with that so that we can see. The, I said the problem with us The reason we are preaching and preaching and doing this thing and people are not being born again, the problem is our spirit are contaminated. Our spirit are contaminated. And that's why whatever we try to do, especially to try to get people born again, you can't lead people to be born again if your spirit is dirty. If we could learn to clean our spirit, the very thing that has become new. You remember the Bible says you become a new creation. Now, when you become born again, your flesh doesn't change. I was ugly before I was born again. Am I beautiful after I'm born again? They don't become smaller now that I'm born again. So it's not a... It's not a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. When you are born again, it is your spirit that has been changed. So this thing, it's not what you say with your mouth. It's what your mouth, what your mouth is saying, where does it come from? It's a spirit to spirit combat. It's not a physical to spiritual. That's why it's not what you say. If it was what you say, many people would have been born again. But the problem is, when they are born again and they look at you, they wouldn't see what you are talking about. You are saying something, they see another thing different. So, the problem is our spirit. And so we need to work on our spirit and cleanse our spirit. If our spirit is clean, look, you don't need to talk. You need to be there for things to happen. Because it's not what you are saying, it's what your spirit is saying. When you are silent, when you are quiet, your spirit is talking. And it is that part that makes you get other people to become into Jesus. So when your spirit is not right, it doesn't matter what you say, people hear, they don't hear what you are speaking. Remember, 
Jesus says, the mouth speaks that which the heart is full of. If your heart is full of sin, and then you are trying to say to people, hey guys, you must be born again, people become confused. The confusion come becomes because of what you are saying and what your spirit are saying are two different things. We need to cleanse our spirit. Let me give you one more illustration. Who of you, if you go to hospital and you are, you are sick, and the nurse who's coming to attend you has got a wound, blood is oozing from his forehead, he says, I'm coming to attend you. Who of you will agree, says, yeah, attend me? You say, attend yourself first. It's exactly the same thing. When your spirit is not right, you are trying to tell Jesus. People look at, have you seen people look at, with that look, says, no <laughs> have, you had, have, have you had that look? I like it when people look at it, it says, preach to yourself first. And then when it comes, says, maybe look at it, little at the head. <laughs> they are going to say you will be number one on the queue. <laughs> the problem is our spirit. Are you hearing me, friends? And I showed it. Illust- I'm going to illustrate it one more time today because I want to go to today's message. Mark chapter 5. Let's pick it up from Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. Let's pick it up from verse 1. Mark chapter 5 from verse 1. Now, in Mark chapter 5, verse 1, uh, you can get the same story in Luke chapter 8, but I'm sitting on Mark chapter 5. Then they came onto the other side of the sea. Remember, this is Jesus. They are in the Sea of Galilee. Okay? On the Sea of Galilee. Oh, by the way, the team that goes with us to Israel this year, the first four nights will be sleeping at the Sea of Galilee. The first four nights will be staying at Sea of Galilee. The second remaining nights will be at Den Hotel in, in Jerusalem. Okay. Those who want to come with me. Oh, by the way, we had a meeting yesterday, and those who still want to come, next Saturday, come. Six o'clock, let's talk. Is that okay? So they were on the other side of the Sea of Galilee in the country of Gadaranites. And while he came out of the boat, just Jesus, then immediately they met him out of the tombs. Out of the what? Out of the what? This person stay in the tomb. Are you getting it? A man with an unclean spirit. He has a what? Unclean what? Not a dirty spirit. Unclean. If we contaminate our spirit, we don't have un, we don't have unclean spirit. We have a dirty spirit. But this one had an. That's demon. Is that okay? Verse 3. Who had his dwelling among the tombs? This person was living in the graveyard. And no one could bind him, not even with chains. Hey, it's a serious one. Verse 4. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. You know, shackles are these big irons they are putting dangerous criminals on their legs and then they are moving like this. And then the police are watching them with guns. Is that okay? Those are shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him. That means even if they have put chains on him, he just then the chains fall off. And the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles been broken in pieces. Now, if you, if, if you could see those irons that they are locking dangerous crime, and they even lock them there, 
but he will, he will just sort them and then break them. I mean, those, they are very thick, but they break them like that. Neither could anyone tame him. That means nobody could tame him. Nobody. He was wild, this person. Are you hearing me, friends? And always night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs. In the mountains and in the tombs. Now, crying out and cutting himself. Now, those of you who have gone to Israel, you will see on this side of Gedera Rins, where this man was, it was a mountain. There's a, there's a big mountain there. And then you're going down on the mountain, you get Gedera Rins, then you're going straight into the Sea of Galilee. So, he will stay in those mountains. And then he will stay in the tombs. He was crying out, cutting himself with stones. That means he'll cut himself and cry, cut himself. Now, nobody will come near such person because he'll cut himself, he will break chains, he will break shackles, they'll try to do anything, nobody will do anything to him. Verse 6, but when he saw Jesus, When he saw, when he saw, tell your neighbor, you will see Jesus. When he saw Jesus from afar, he didn't see him whilst he was here. He saw him, remember, everybody was running away from this person. Nobody came near him. Because if you come with a chain, he breaks the chain like anything else. You bring a shackle, he breaks it. Anything you bring, he breaks it. And then he'll cut himself with stones. And he'll cry out. But when he saw Jesus from afar, now he did something. This is what caught my attention. He ran, and what did he do? Excuse me, sir. I thought you are a madman. I thought the demons in you break chains. I thought the demons in you break shackles. They make you cut yourself with stones and cry in the mountain. They make you not to sleep in a house. They make you stay in the mountain, stay in the tombs. Do you know Jesus? How did he know Jesus? Not only how did he know Jesus. He ran to him and he sub, his spirit submitted to the spirit of Jesus. When you are worshiping, you are submitting your spirit. So he worshiped Jesus. Excuse me. There were people who would come and bind him with chains. He will break the chains. But when he sees Jesus, it means the people who used to bind him, their spirit were contaminated. That's why when he see a clean spirit, Are you getting it now? It is a clean spirit, a pure spirit, a holy spirit that makes even a madman worship God. Are you getting it now? And that's where I want us. The reason we am teaching on righteousness is so that your spirit can be clean. When you are righteous, you are right standing with God. Your spirit is righteous. When people who are ugly, people who are evil, people who are demonized, when they see your spirit, immediately they submit and then they worship God. It is not what you say. It is what the condition of your spirit that is preaching. Are you getting it now? 
What is the temperature of your spirit? If we were to measure it with a scale of 1 to 10, and 10 being the holiest, 1 to 10, where are you? How is your spirit? What is your spirit saying? Listen to me, church. When you meet people you don't know, just to meet them, your spirit is talking to your spirit is talking to their spirit. Have you heard somebody they have never met before, and somebody say, "You know, I'm the man." Have you heard people say that? I think this one you understand, am I right? What happened? Your spirit is talking, his spirit is talking to your spirit. And his spirit, find that your spirit is holy, closer to God. And his spirit is saying, you need to repent. Then an orchestra book is free. We must have our spirit clean. Remember, if a nurse is bleeding and she's trying to bind your wounds, you won't even allow her to touch you. You say to her, nurse, please, go and attend to yourself first. When you are fine, come back and help me. Or get another nurse to come and help me. Is that okay? Now, when we are bleeding, our spirits are bleeding because we are doing things that contaminate your spirit. That's why, listen to me, church, can I tell you something? Can I tell you something that will shock you? Do you know why they are witches? Their purpose is to contaminate your spirit, then leave you. <laughs> That's all. Their duty is to contaminate your spirit. Once your spirit is contaminated, they don't care. You can come, you can sing, oh, Jesus, Guillaume, Tanda. They don't care. They know your spirit is contaminated. You are Jason Giam Tanda. It's not shaking them because it's coming from a contaminated spirit. You can sing, oh, Ujeso Unamanda. Avanata Avaluet. Because Ujeso Unamanda Yako is coming from a contaminated spirit. Have you heard sometimes say, hey, I've got this pain. Please lay hands on me. They lay hands on you. The pain does not go. Why? The spirit that lay hands on you is contaminated spirit. Hey, I have this. I feel this is a demon. Please cast it out. You, you, you can't cast out a spirit, demon with a contaminated spirit. The demon will tell you, go clean your spirit. They will tell you. Go clean yourself up. Church, the reason when Jesus come, people who will go with Jesus are people with not contaminated spirit. People with clean spirit. Should I show it to you in the Bible? Or is it the glitz who sits? Says the one the contamination is a lit. Let me show you that a contaminated spirit you can't do better than the Pharisees and the scribes when your spirit is contaminated. So last Sunday, I showed you one way of cleaning your spirit. Today, I'm showing you the second way. Are you ready? How many are ready? Certainly, look, is it there last Sunday? This is the Linyaka in Wehaf. So today, I'm going to show you the second way how to clean your spirit. Are you ready? If I was belonging to that church, I was going to ask 5,000 each. 
on the table. No 5,000, no listening. But Jesus says, I've given this thing to you freely. Freely you receive, freely give. Is that okay? Are you ready for the second way of cleaning your spirit? Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Verse, let's start at verse 25. Ephesians 5 verse 25. How do we clean our spirit? Number two. I've given you first one. Last Sunday, uh, it was to Go on fasting and cleaning. There's nothing that cleans your spirit like fasting. Now the second one, here it comes. So I'm announcing the second one. Is that okay? <clears throat> Husbands, love your wives. Hey. Every husband in the house, please stand. If you are a married man, please stand. If you are a married man, stay. All the married men, stay. We have so many. <whistles> what happened to the other men? Bahati Lekitrin. Gentlemen, Jesus is giving us an instruction. He says, husband, love your wives. It says, husband, I won't go much into it because I thought I would do something. I thought loving your wife is buying her a chocolate and buying her a house and a car. My wife will look at me and say, you think one tata we read to know? And then I put my tail, my tail, my behind the legs. I thought this is loving. She says, Husband, do what? So gentlemen, the Bible says we should love our wives. And I can tell you, it's not what you are telling me. No, it's what your wife will tell me. So I'm going to ask them to queue after the service to tell me, all those whose husband loved, they feel loved, queue in my office. Surely there will be half who will come. Take a seat, gentlemen. The Bible says we should do what? Love our... Okay? Just as Christ also loved the church. How did he love the church? This is the part. What is the, this is the remaining part of the sentence? He what? If you don't give yourself to her, you have not loved her. I'm preaching to myself also. If we make an altar call, I'm the first one to come. Somebody must pray for us. He gave himself, for, it is Jesus, he gave us an example. He loved the church. What did he do? He gave himself for the church. Are you getting it? Let's not get distracted. You are going to where we clean our spirit. Is that okay? We are going there. He gave himself for her. 26. That he might sanctify her and cleanse her. Okay? Imagine the analogy of, the, of Jesus loving the church. So that Jesus can cleanse the church. Not only clean the church, he, he is sanctifying it. Okay? With the washing of water. So there is a water Jesus is using to wash the church. There is a water. That Jesus is using to clean the church. I think we can all relate to cleaning. Is that okay, ladies? 
I'm not talking about those who have washing machine. No, those are too, too sophisticated. I'm talking those who still wash in a basin. You remember those who still wash in a basin? Okay? Those who are washing in the basin. He is washing it with the water. But what is this water that Jesus is using to cleanse you? The second thing that cleanses your spirit is the word of God. Are you seeing it now? It is the word of God. Somebody please bring my Bible on the, on the, on the desk there. So he can wash it. He sanctified. I'm coming to sanctify it. He is sanctifying it. Jesus, he loved it. How does he do? Sanctify it. And he cleanses it with the washing. I know this because I grew up Kuma High, then we were washing. If it's, even if it's a blanket, bing, 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 bing. until the sunset, is that okay? At the sunset, and then we are praying that it. Washing with the water. That washing, the water that you are doing, especially if it is a, a big thing or a the water becomes contaminated. And then you throw the water away, put in new water, put in new soap. Am I right? If it's a blanket, we even come into the bath. <laughs> now the older folks are laughing because that's what we used to do. Many. You take a big bath, Bath tub, put water, and then put more soap and throw the blanket in there. And then you start dancing on top of the on the blanket. As you are dancing, the wife is dancing this side, the husband is dancing that side. <laughs> and then as they are dancing, the, the blankets get cleaner. Is that okay? Then they take it out, turn it around. <laughs> Then the blanket is clean. And then when the, water, when the blanket is cleaner, the water becomes even cleaner. That's a sign to tell you the blanket is clean. The bigger the blanket, the more water you need. The older you are, the more the word you need. Are you seeing it? Friends, the only water that you can cleanse your spirit is the word of God. That's why it is not in the fashion anymore to read God's word. People don't read it anymore. That's why nobody carries the Bible anymore. You can look at young people, look at them. Any of them carrying this anymore? No, it's too outdated for them. That's why their spirits are more contaminated. Okay, they, they use electronic Bible, which is good. I love them. Is that okay, guys? Your phones have all gone to internet, am I right? Okay, when you are tired of pornography, then you can go to the Bible, right? <laughs> I was reading this, this research studies. I think it was done in the U.S., they say young people spend eight hours on internet. Eight hours. And, and internet is pretty wide. Renaba Tababaholu, we can't handle it. But the young people enjoy it. Am I guys? Am I right, guys? On your phones. That's why 
I know we no longer carry the Bible anymore. We carry this one. Okay? Whether you carry this one or you carry this one, that's immaterial. It is what is written in there to come into you to wash you. Show me anybody that is clean. I will show you somebody that disease refused to speak to them. Show me anybody who is clean. I will show you somebody that the enemy is, is afraid of. Show me anybody who is clean, I will show you somebody that people hate without a reason. David says, they hate me without a cause. David, why do they hate you? David, all he did was to kill Goliath. Why did he kill Goliath? He killed Goliath because Goliath was bringing a reproach to the nation. And David says, what can be done to this uncircumcised Philistine so that he, we can remove the reproach to the nation? David was full of God's word. That's why his spirit was clean. He wouldn't kill Goliath if he had a contaminated spirit. Goliath would have killed him. The reason Saul couldn't attack Goliath, it is because Saul, his spirit was contaminated. He was not pure. That's why he had jealousy. When women started dancing, David killed 10,000, Saul killed 1,000. He said, did you hear that? Let's kill him. The people with contaminated spirit want to destroy people with clean spirit. The people with contaminated spirit, their duty is to contaminate those who are clean. If you check in a church situation, you will find People in the church who are agent of contamination, they come in and they begin to contaminate people. In a local church. But friends, I've got news for you. If, you. if you drink God's word, if you read God's word, read it daily, every spare time you have, that's why I have a problem myself of watching television because if I can watch television for 30 minutes, I feel guilty. I says, if I could have used that 30 minutes just to read the Bible, I will be a better person. Listen to me, friends. All the time you spend watching television, if you could take half of that time, not all the time, half of the time you spend watching television, Use that time to read the Bible. Take what is here, whether written Bible or electronic Bible. Today we even have an audio Bible. You just put it in your ears here and then somebody read it for you. You listen. That's why if you want to do anything, the enemy will never attack you. But Try to go and sit on your dining room and try to read the Bible. You'll see trouble. The moment you try to read the Bible, somebody knock. Has that happened to somebody? I know the reason you are laughing is because it's happening to you. Right? The enemy will do anything to make sure 
you don't get God's word into your spirit. That's why Jesus says the parable of the sower. He says when the word is sown, Satan cometh immediately to steal the word. The reason I am preaching in series instead of the hit and run messages is so that what the enemy has stolen, I put it back. That's who, that's how God has the grace he has given me. I know other people have got other graces. My grace is what the enemy has stolen from you. I put it back. And then next week, I add something else on top. Put back, add something else. Put back and add something else. So that your spirit could be uncontaminated. What is it that makes you uncontaminated? It's not my preaching until I sweat and then to later lamezi. It is the word of God that gets into your spirit. I am not attacking pastors who do that. I'll, some of my friends, I love them. I would even give them a new tower. <laughs> but it is not the towel in your spirit that comes in. It is the word of God. It is, it is not... I, Jesus, help us. Have you realized... You who sit under the teaching of the word, you are different from other people. Have you seen that? Because the word of God cleanses your spirit. So the more you read God's word, the cleaner you are. You don't need to do anything. Just take God's word, put it in your spirit. Take God's word, put it in your, it will make you cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. You won't know whether you are clean. Heaven knows. That's why I want you to take you back. I don't know how many hours you have, but I think all of us has 24 hours. Is that all right? What is the tithe of, what is 10% of 24? Is it not two hours, 40 minutes? Huh? Is that a say? You agree with me? I mean, those with computerized thinking. I think 10% of 24 should be two point. If somebody give you 24 rand, it means two rand 40 is not yours. Is that right? Belongs to God. Okay. So God has given us almost every one of us 24 hours. Wouldn't you take two hours, 40 minutes and just give it to God? And read, just, just read the Bible at least one hour. And then use the other hour and 40 minutes in prayer. Or use one hour, 40 minutes reading the word of God so that you can be clean. Because I can assure you, I'm going to show you just now from the Bible. If your spirit is not clean, you are not going to heaven. Let me say it one more time. If your spirit is not clean, and it is God's word that cleanses you. Muruti, how should you read the Bible? Just read the Bible. Do you read newspaper? Yes. Do you read magazine? Ladies, do you buy magazine? You enjoy magazines, right? Or at least I electronic magazine. Or what? Okay, I talked to guys. Do they read? They don't read, ne? But neto lebala mubango fel. When the day of reckoning comes, what you saw on the television won't speak for you before the throne of grace. But what you have put in your spirit, what will you have read, 
And it will make you cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. And we, we, you can't go and tell people, I'm not a school. No, we're not a school. <laughs> you need to cleanse yourself. Am I talking to somebody today? Let me show you that if your spirit is not clean, you are not going there. Guys, I think you, you left me at Ephesians 5.26, right? Bring back verse 26. It says, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the word. He is washing with the what? It's the word of God. That's why I, I plead with everybody. Those of you, especially younger generation. Younger generation, buy, okay, download the audible Bible in your cell phone. And then... Let somebody read it and you listen. All you do, listen. There is a Bible, the whole Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. Listen to God's word. There is no priority. There no Bala verse, Epili chapter 8, then Yaburaru. No, just read the Bible. Read it in sequence. During our time, when there were no cell phones, there were no nothing. We used to write our girlfriends or our wives letters. You don't start reading five, fifth page, then go to first one. You read first page, then second, three, four, five, so that you can get a flow of thinking. That's exactly what's happening. Am I talking to somebody here today? Read God's word, verse 27. That he, who's the he? Jesus. He might present her. Present who? The church. Okay. To himself a what? A glorious church is a church that is cleansed by the word. Not having a what? A spot or a... Or any such things. But that she should be what? You see, when you read God's word, it makes you holy. The word of God makes you holy. The word of God makes you holy. How does it make you holy? I'm going to teach this probably the Lord allow us next Sunday. How it makes you holy. But let me give you a foretaste. Is that okay? Hebrews 4, verse 16, verse 12. Hebrews 4, 12. I want, let me show you the, how it helps you. Hebrews 4, 12 says, For the word of the Lord is what? Aish. The word of the Lord is? Bring it in the NLT. For the word of the Lord is what? It's alive. Now, I don't know if this thing has happened to you. If it is cold and you drink a hot beverage, what does it make you? It makes you warm. If it is cold and you drink a cold drink, what will it do to you? It affects you. What is in the drink gets transferred into your body. When you read something that is alive, it transfers what is it it is into your body, into your spirit. So when you take something alive and you put it in you, it makes your spirit alive. Are you getting it now? I think you understand this better because... Nobody drinks cold drinks on such a cold weather. Is that okay? We drink hot drinks. Am I right? And then Eskom switch off the lights. <laughs> because every house, the kettle is on. So the word of God is alive. When you read, any part you read, you are taking alive something, you put it in you. You are taking something live, you put it in your spirit. 
You take something, you put it in your spirit. You take something, you put it in your spirit. Listen to me, church. If you take God's word into your body, death won't come to you because death is afraid of God's word. It's not afraid of you. Satan is not afraid of you, but he's afraid of the word of God in you. That's why, listen to me carefully. We, we, we are having a generation this time, Jesus call it a, a Jesus call it a adulterous generation. Every time you have an a, a temptation to commit fornication is a sign your spirit is empty. Read God's word during the time when you are tempted to have sex that the, the, the temptation will go. If all of a sudden you, you feel somehow, you feel, no, take God's word and read. You see what happened. If you are fearful, take God's word and read. The word of God will chase out fear. If you are discouraged, take God's word and read. The discouragement will go. If you are depressed, take God's word, put it in you. The depression will go. If you are anxious, take God's word, put it in you. The anxiety will go. If you are hopeless, take God's word, put it in you. The hope comes up fresh. <clears throat> If you are broke, take God's word, put it in you. It will attract wealth. It will attract money. Am I talking to somebody here? That's why when you are in trouble and you begin to quote God's word, fish. I. When you are in trouble and you speak God's word, you are piercing that situation with the word that is alive. And if that situation was bringing death to you, when you pierce it with something alive, the alive in the word will drive out the death in the situation. Bring back verse 27 one more time. For the word of God is alive and it is fresh. Tell your neighbor, there's power in you. There's power in you. Are you hearing me, friend? It is word, it's alive and it is, it is powerful. So your neighbor is powerful. Any child of God who reads the word is powerful. That's why that word that is in you, you don't need to do anything. Speak that word to any situation. That word will pierce the situation. Because the word, not only is it alive, but it is. And here is it. If there is more power needed. God just add more power to it. So the word of God is alive and it is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. I will show you two-edged sword. Now, it's cutting between two things. It is cutting between the soul and the there are some things you like which are not good for you. The word of God is able to separate what you like and what is good for you. There are many things we love, but the word of God will separate those things. Between the soul and the spirit. Because these things that come to come and contaminate your heart, they first, they are show me is your soul. The soul is a dangerous thing. 
I had one evangelist. No, I love evangelists. I had one evangelist saying, the soul is like a prostitute. Your soul is like a prostitute. Now, a prostitute doesn't care who comes. Is that okay? And that's how our soul is like. Have you been fasting and you're watching television, which you are not supposed to do, and then you see them putting a, a, a hamburger on flames? And what does your soul say? break Can you see the prostitute? <laughs> or have you been sitting and you see on television, they are showing them drinking sparkling wine in a small, thin, tall glass. And then they are sipping a little. you remind you remember your days. That's your soul. That's a prostitute. That's why the Bible calls it. <laughs> in the spirit, in, in, in the biblical, it calls it the heart. That's what the Bible says. The heart is desperately wicked. Have you had my wife read this verse? The heart is deceitful above all. That's a prostitute. A prostitute. It's deceitful above all. I remember in the Bible, was it, I think it was Hosea. Yeah, Hosea. God said to Hosea, go and marry a prostitute. <laughs> Gentlemen, who of you, if the Lord says go marry a prostitute, will go do? Because how will a miracle? And now it's like a miracle. Your emotion is like a prostitute. That's why all the things that you like, even those that kills your health, not never mind your spirit, that kills your health, your soul loves it. And it is the word of God that can go and separate, cut across what your soul wants and what the spirit is all about. That's why he says it's sharper than any two. It's cutting between the soul and the what? Can you see that? It cuts across. It cuts across also against the joint and the marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and what? There are many things you desire and they are not right for you. The word of the Lord will cut across. Who says, wait a bit. I used to like this thing. I don't longer like it anymore. What has happened here? The word of God is an emotion. And this is how we become born again. We become born again by the word of God. Not by anything else. It is the word of God. It is this word that is cleansing me. Show me any child of God who is reading God's word. I'll show you somebody who is clean. Even when they talk, it also deals with your thoughts. Did you see the word thoughts there? Bring back that verse. Can you see thoughts? The word of God will control your thoughts. Instead of thinking wicked things, the word of God will cut across the thinking of thoughts evil thoughts. If you desire ugly things, the word of God will cut across the... Because this word of God, Jesus must present you to the Father. He cannot present anybody. That's why the Bible says he is the word that became flesh. When you take God's word in you, you are taking in Jesus. Because he is the word that became flesh. So you're taking Jesus, putting him back in. When you put Jesus back in you, he begins to kick out all the rubbish that are contaminating. 
Makasipro, stand to your feet. Come on. I want you to worship the Lord this morning. Stand to your feet and begin to worship God. Let the word that is in you. You see, when you worship, it is the word in you that is worshiping God. Go ahead, begin to worship the Lord. Open your mouth and begin to worship Him. And begin to worship Him. Let the word divide inside the soul and the marrow and the joints, the bones, and the thoughts exposing every evil thing. Let the word of God Allow the word of God. 